Welcome to the Pharmaceutical Industry Labor Management Association's webinar on vaccines, health, and safety. I saw from the RSVP list a lot of familiar uh, faces and, and friends, um, and I just wanted to say I'm really looking forward to a time we can all meet together. Um, as most of you know, PILMA, uh, uh, known the Pharmaceutical Industry Labor Management Association, for more than 15 years has been at the nexus of a partnership between the biopharmaceutical industry and then mostly, skill, mostly the skilled union craft workers who work in that industry. I can't think of a year where that partnership um, has, has been more important than this past year uh, battling the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of you may know uh, uh, that in nearly every facility where vaccines in the US and treatments and therapies were developed by the biopharmaceutical industry to fight this pandemic of COVID-19, the facilities were built uh, by skilled union craft workers. So uh, going forward, uh, until we can find a time to get together, we thought we'd provide single subject webinars and uh, sources of information for you, our partners, so you can learn a little bit more about um, the policy matters and some of the, some of the science and medicine behind uh, the, the work that kind of goes on behind the scenes. Uh, the biopharmaceutical industry has been able to put the best trained, most productive, and in this instance, the safest workers in the world to work to battle the pandemic. We're lucky uh, today and we're fortunate throughout the year to have great resources at hand in this partnership. Uh, we'll hear from two folks today, Dr. Mikey Barra, who is with Pharma, and Dr. Wayne Kreis, and, and Wayne Kreisap, who is the safe, a, a safety director at the Iron Workers Union. A little bit about our format first. Um, we're gonna hear presentations from, from both gentlemen and there will be a time if you look down uh, on the tab to, to type in a question and uh, you can use the Q&A box located at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. We're not sure we'll get to all of them, but we'll try to select some questions that are representative of some of the things uh, we're asking. So let me just hop right into it. We're very fortunate to hear from Dr. Mike Ibarra as I mentioned, he is a board certified emergency physician. He's vice president at Pharma and chief medical affairs uh, officer at Pharma. In this capacity of Pharma, Dr. Barra leads stakeholder outreach and works with uh, engagement uh, in international and, and federal affairs. And as I like to say in your spare time, Dr. Mike, you also still work as uh, clinically in the emergency department of MedStore at Georgetown University uh, Hospital. I can't think of a better person who's had uh, frontline experience and also understands some of the policy matters. So I'll, I'll ask Mike for you to give us some of your insights. Great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate being back. I know I've been with you a few times this year, uh, and I'm happy to, uh, to share kind of an update on where we're at with the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, first of all, I, I uh, want to just kind of give the latest CDC stats. Uh, I just was on their website and we're at 276 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine that have been administered in the U.S. 60% uh, of folks in the U.S., 18 and up, have received at least one vaccine uh, and almost 50% are, are fully vaccinated. We're getting very close to having 50% of all adults fully vaccinated, which is really incredible. And uh, you can see in all of the statistics that the cases are starting to really, really come down. It feels like the, the pandemic is starting to implode in the U.S. That doesn't mean we're not going to have challenges uh, coming down uh, in the next few months, but it does feel good that we're, we're, we're really seeing the benefits of the vaccine. Uh, the cases coming down are now because of the vaccine and the high vaccine uptake that we've, we've seen. And if you've heard me talk before, which I think some of you have, when I think and talk about the COVID-19 vaccine, I always like to start by showing the virus. This is SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the COVID-19 uh, disease. And uh, one key thing when you're thinking about vaccinating is a lot of people hear vaccine and they immediately think, oh, I'm probably getting some sort of like inactivated form of the virus. I'm getting this. They somehow killed it. And that's what the vaccine is. So I'm seeing the whole virus. And then that leads to the very common question we get, which is, can you get COVID from the vaccine? And what we're doing uh, with the manufacturing of vaccines in the US, what companies like Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson have done, they're not showing you the whole virus. What they're doing is they're actually teaching 
teaching you just to recognize the tiny spike proteins on the outside of the virus, those red uh, images that you see here, that's the spike protein. That's the really unique part of this virus that makes it different from the flu. Uh, co coronaviruses have the spike protein. That's why they uh, look like a crown under the microscope and that's how they got their name. So the vaccines are just about teaching your body how to recognize that spike protein without exposing you to the virus itself. So you're at no risk of getting COVID-19 from the, from the vaccine. And the companies that are investigating, uh, you know, many of which are, are pharma member companies, which we're, we're incredibly proud of, and those of you on the phone who've who have been contributing to the development of the vaccine and the manufacturing of the vaccine uh, at Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and, and other companies. Uh, there are really three main scientific approaches that are being used to develop the vaccines. You have the mRNA approach of which we have two that are on the market now. You have the adenovirus vector approach that you see in the middle uh, that we have one on the market now with others being looked at uh, potentially for, for authorization in the coming months. And then you have the uh, kind of protein-based approach, which is that top, that number one. And I'll walk through them each very briefly. Uh, at the bottom, I start there because that's the two that were authorized first. Uh, you have mRNA vaccines. And what mRNA is, is basically it's a blueprint. And it's telling your body what the spike protein looks like uh, just in the form of genetic code. Um, so the mRNA, it's a blueprint for the spike protein. Your cells take that up after you get the injection. For about a day, they churn out some spike protein so that your body can could recognize it, you develop antibodies, those spike proteins, that mRNA goes away, it doesn't stay in your body, uh, it's there for a very, very short period of time, but the immune reaction that you had, the immune cells that you generate, that stays with you for a period of time. We know it lasts for at least six months now, but potentially longer. We're studying that now to know how long your immunity lasts for. So that's the mRNA approach. Again, it's just the spike protein instructions, you're not getting the whole virus, you're not going to get COVID-19 from the vaccine. The second that is the approach that's being, uh, that has been authorized by J&J, &J, it's also being uh, used in the AstraZeneca vaccine that was authorized in other parts of the country. They actually use the shell of an adenovirus. They, they take out all of the parts. It's like just using like the orange peel. You have the, the shell of the adenovirus and then you put the blueprints for the spike protein on the inside and you use that as like a car to carry it into the body. Similar type idea where your body is just learning to recognize the spike protein. All of that goes away within about a day or two, but then the immune reaction that you develop, the antibodies, the uh, memory that you have uh, allows you to fight COVID-19 if you ever come in contact with the actual virus. So those first two, the mRNA, the adenovirus approach, that's the Moderna, Pfizer, and then the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. There's actually a whole new class of vaccines that are in development now from companies like Novavax. And then if you read the news uh, just two days ago, Sanofi in partnership with GSK is actually developing a vaccine using this method as well. It's a bit more of a, um, uh, uh, it's, a it's a different method because you're actually injecting the spike protein. Uh, what they're doing is they're developing it outside of the body. They're developing it in, in insect cells. So using moth cells, for example, to purify this spike protein. And then that's what the injection is. You're just getting like the actual spike protein. It doesn't stay in your body forever. It stays in for about a day or two before it's broken down and, and goes away. Um, but again, in that time, you get the injection, you see the spike protein, your body mounts an immune response so that you ever see the whole COVID-19 virus. You have those immune memory cells to fight it. <clears throat> and all of these vaccines work very, very well. They all went through the phases of clinical trial process or are doing that now. Um, you know, you probably have, have seen this in some way, shape or form in the past, uh, but we have a number of vaccine candidates that are under investigation um, and they've all are going through this process. No steps were skipped. Um, the, the, the reason that we could get to an answer very quickly is because in some cases, steps were able to occur more in parallel as opposed to in strict series. So when Sanofi and GSK announced two days ago that they had some positive data from their phase two clinical trials, um, studying the vaccine in a, in a small number of people, they said they were gonna start manufacturing that vaccine at risk so that once they got the results from their phase three clinical trial, once it was authorized, they would be ready to go. And we saw that with Pfizer as well and Moderna so that when their vaccines were authorized, we saw those UPS trucks pull into the facility in Kalamazoo, Michigan, they took vaccine uh, that was ready because they had already begun manufacturing at, at risk before they knew if they were gonna get authorization. But that's what allowed us to be vaccinating people days, within days or hours of the vaccine authorization coming from FDA and then CDC. So these are the steps of the clinical trial process. Again, none of them were skipped uh, for the vaccines that are currently authorized. 
You typically have the preclinical testing where you're looking in a lab in a test tube to kind of understand how the vaccines work. Then you move to the phase one and phase two clinical trials where you're testing it on a small number of individuals to understand how the vaccine reacts in the body. You just, you kind of monitor how the vaccine works by checking blood, seeing how many antibodies are being developed. You try to make sure you have the right dose. Um, I did understand some vaccine manufacturers when they were going through this process, they did lower the dose because they found they didn't need to use as high a dose as they originally thought. And then of course the phase three clinical trials, those are the really large clinical trials where you study it on 30, 40,000 individuals uh, to understand if you are able to prevent people from getting COVID-19 from those that receive the vaccine. Um, so we have really good results from phase three clinical trials from the vaccines that have been authorized. This is where we're currently at in the world uh, or in the United States with the uh, vaccine authorization. Of course, everyone knows Pfizer was first uh, authorized in December of 2020. Uh, and then, you know, as soon as that authorization happened, we saw those trucks pull up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, and we saw a vaccine coming off, uh, coming out of that plant and, and very quickly going into the arms of Americans. Uh, and, you know, um, many million doses since then. Uh, right after that, uh, Moderna received their authorization, a similar, similar mechanism, that mRNA vaccine. And then just a few months later, we added another tool to the toolbox, which is the Johnson & Johnson single shot COVID-19 vaccine. And as Tim mentioned, I'm an emergency physician. Uh, so I see a lot of patients uh, of all walks of life. Uh, we see the spectrum of disease, the spectrum of illness. We see the spectrum of, of social situations as well. Uh, a lot of people that are uh, you know, homeless, for example, and some emergency departments have actually begun trialing single dose J&J uh, &J for homeless populations that might come into the ER, might not have any other interaction with the healthcare system. But if we can make a difference Difference, that's a great tool to be able to add to the to the toolbox. There are, as I mentioned, additional vaccines that are on the horizon. Uh, for example, AstraZeneca released data in March, and uh, potential uh, potential uh, kind of discussions with FDA are ongoing there. Uh, Novavax, which is not too far from here, is continuing to investigate their vaccine using the protein approach, um, and they are they indicated that they might seek authorization in Q3 of 2021. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Sanofi GSK, two pharma members have teamed up to uh, study a protein-based uh, vaccine, and they announced some early results just two days ago, we could potentially see that one uh, kind of moving down the pike uh, th through the rest of 2021. So now we're in a situation where we have multiple shots that have made it in goal. We have two mRNA vaccines, one adenovirus vector vaccine that is on the market and authorized in the U.S., Hopefully folks on this line have received the vaccine, but I know that you know people still might have questions. And so everybody that wants a vaccine or wanted a vaccine uh, up to this point probably already got it. Uh, my guess is that if you wanted it, you were anxious to get it, you found a way to get it early, or you waited, your, uh, you waited throughout the, the point where we could kind of make it much more easy for folks to get it, kind of open things up. Um, so my guess is that most people that have wanted a vaccine at this point in time have probably got it. Um, so now the really hard work begins where we have to seek out people that maybe had questions, you know, maybe were uh, concerned about getting it. And, you know, we have to do a bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat where we talk to our family, we talk to our friends, we talk to our friends' friends. Uh, we try to answer those questions, try to make it easy, try to get them to feel comfortable uh, getting the vaccine. And so I always like to start this part of the talk by telling my story. Uh, this is me. No, I did not get four COVID vaccines, but I will show you four pictures, starting with uh, my entry in a clinical trial last uh, August, August of 2020. I was really excited to participate in the mRNA vaccine clinical trials. Uh, I got one shot in August. I got another shot in September. And then I was just told to go live my life. I kept working in the ER, obviously wore a mask. Uh, I used an N95 when I was taking care of COVID patients. Uh, but they studied you know, 30,000 people like me to see how many folks got COVID. Uh, we didn't know if we got the placebo or if we got the actual vaccine. So come December, when they released the results, they found it was 95% effective at reducing COVID infections in people that got the, the vaccine. I then found out I was actually in the placebo group. Thankfully, I didn't get COVID throughout that time. But shortly thereafter, I was able to get the vaccine, um, actual dose, one in December and then another one in January. So really happy to be vaccinated. Uh, and I tell that story in part because I want folks to know uh, that I participated in the clinical trials. 
I saw that no steps were being skipped, uh, that we had to go through all the normal processes uh, that myself and 30,000 other uh, folks in that particular clinical trial, uh, we were, we were uh, able to provide that information so that we have good data on safety and of course on efficacy. Um, so that's me telling my story, but individuals on this phone might have totally different stories. Like what's your why? Why did you do it? Why did you feel comfortable? Uh, and telling your uh, experience and your story is really important to getting other folks vaccinated as well. Um, so with that, I think we have uh, time for questions and, uh, and I'll turn it back to, uh, to Tim. Sorry, I'm having trouble clicking. Um, speaking of the science, I think it's absolutely fascinating, Mike, that um, things like uh, uh, hosts for, uh, for the clinical trials were actually insects. I saw my first cicada yesterday Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll have billions and billions of volunteers. For <laughs> but let's a couple questions about the science. One in particular, I mean, there was some recent news about the New York Yankees. I'm not a Yankees hater. I'm not a Yankees fan. But, uh, you know, there were several members of the New York Yankees team who I would imagine, um, you know, were far along in the pro vaccine protocols. What does it mean for the science that, you know, um, that people can still get it or are the numbers aligned with, with the, these kinds of incidences? Sure. So uh, two things. The, the insect cells are actually really interesting because they're being used, uh, the cells are being used to generate the spike protein. So it's kind of a purified approach. So it is really, it is really cool and really neat. And one thing we're lucky in the U.S. is that we have multiple options available right now. Um, so, you know, you can actually talk to your doctor. It's a very unique, lucky position that we can be in. So you can talk to your doctor about what might be best for you based on what's on the market. Uh, in terms of the Yankee situation, I actually think that, um, you know, it is really interesting. Thing. They're testing everyone regardless of symptoms. And one of the things that we, uh, we know from that uh, kind of that experience is that most of the people that tested positive didn't actually have any symptoms of COVID-19. They had one person that had symptoms. They had uh, several others that didn't. Um, and we don't have a ton of data on the adenovirus vaccines right now to know if you can transmit, but we actually do have some good data from CDC on the mRNA vaccines and the fact that it actually reduces the transmission. Um, so even if you test positive, what Dr. Fauci has said is it's kind of like a dead end. Um, even if you're a breakthrough case, um, the current data kind of indicates that it's not like you're going to transmit it. That's one of the reasons that the CDC actually updated their guidance for fully vaccinated individuals to say, if you're fully vaccinated, you can pretty much go back to, to, to the way of life that you were used to before, um, where you don't need to wear a mask if you're indoors and outdoors, in part because we know that the vaccine is very effective at preventing you from getting COVID-19. And we also have some indication now that the vaccines do a good job of preventing you from spreading it. Um, so it's not a hundred percent. There's unfortunately nothing that gets us to fully 100 percent, but the data is all pointing in the right direction. And I will say, just going back to your question about the what happened with the Yankees is, you know, they were testing uh, everyone regularly. They were asymptomatic largely, uh, and the vaccine probably did what it was intended to do, which is prevent everyone in that clubhouse from getting COVID-19, which you can imagine uh, might have happened had the vaccine not been in place, given, you know, folks on a team, close quarters, you know, they're going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of contact. Uh, so you, it certainly could have been a lot worse. Uh, I have two questions from two different folks. One, our own Chris Hines and one from Shabir Safter. Shabir, hi and welcome. Shabir works with the Partnership uh, for Safe Medicines. And uh, it, both questions are about the same thing is, I'll ask Shabir, what's the longest we've seen efficacy in the mRNA vaccine so far? If it runs pretty deep, eight plus months, we're, or we're not to get boosters for a while, right? So Chris had the same question. What's the story on boosters? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we know now is that there's pretty good data out about six months post uh, six months post mRNA vaccination because that's really that's about the amount of time that we've had to study it. And so part of the part of the needing to be patient is it's a novel virus, uh, so we don't have long term data about you know we, we've it's only been on the scene for eighteen months, so we we do just need a little bit more time to know how long these vaccines are going to be effective, whether or not we'll need a booster. Um, I guess I'm reassured by the six month data that the vaccine efficacy really didn't. 
change all that much. That six months in, you're still very well protected against COVID-19. This gets into some nitty gritty science, but there are some folks that are kind of on both sides of the issue. There are infectious disease experts and kind of cell biologists that say they're so impressed with the efficacy rates, they think we might be good. There are other folks that say we might need a booster. Uh, and the good news is the companies that uh, manufacture and develop them are studying to know. Uh, so I think we'll have an answer. We'll know by the fall. And the other really good thing is that the CDC recently changed the guidance so that you can get vaccines um, at the same time. You don't need to wait between vaccines. Uh, and that's a big deal for kids in particular, because you know, uh, when you have babies, you go in and you get like six shots at once. The, and um, not to say that we're, we as adults want to get six vaccines at one time, uh, because we know we'll feel pretty, per, pretty tired uh, if, if we were to get that. But it's just something to think about because, you know, we, we all get flu shots in the fall and some companies are actually looking at kind of COVID and flu shot combinations. Uh, and, and I could see a situation as a healthcare provider where, you know, I might need to go in and get my flu shot and my COVID shot. And to me, that's not the end of the world. If that's what we need to do, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but companies are looking into it and I think we'll have some guidance later on this year. Well, Mike, I can't let you get out of here without asking you to put your other hat on. That's your policy hat. And a couple questions have come in. Uh, the, the real, you know, we are citizens of the world and the huge tragedy that's going on in India, 4,500 single day deaths. You know, there have been some, some voices from critics, as you know, both pharma and Filma have stood for very strong IP protections uh, for vaccines as well as other medications because it, it protects U.S. jobs. And it also, uh, since Shabir is here, he's an expert on this, also protects us from uh, counterfeits and, and dangerous uh, medications with shoddy production. But the question would be, what, why is it troubling that, that uh, we would just not give our IP away to a place like India or, or South Africa? Why is that such a problem in terms of um, efficacy of the virus, uh, protection of intellectual properties here in the US and, and, and treating the world? Yeah, well, I think you, you know, one of the one of the only things that I think has gone very well for the United States uh, in this pandemic, you know, we've we've struggled in in a number of ways in our response to COVID nineteen. But I think the things that work were the rapid development of therapeutics and then now vaccines. And clearly, we're in the situation we're in because of the rapid development and the rapid deployment of vaccines. And so we we know that policy the policy environment allowed for that to happen going in. And so I think wanting to break the ecosystem that uh, led to the rapid development of those is, is not the right approach from our perspective. And so there are a lot, plenty of bad ideas out there from our perspective. HR3 is one of them. Uh, it would lead to, you know, up to a million job loss, uh, jobs lost uh, from the industry, you know, greater than 60 fewer new medicines. Uh, but the other that's been talked about is this uh, waiver of intellectual property. And I think that um, you have to you know, certainly respect and commend the administration wanting to address global vaccine access. That's something we all want. Um, we're not safe until everyone's safe. We need to get more vaccines into the arms of, of people in the US and around the world. But you can do that without breaking the intellectual property that led to the development of the vaccines in the first place. In fact, we kind of think it's a false choice. Um, you know, we should be doing more to enhance manufacturing right here in the US um, to make the US the manufacturing hub of these COVID vaccines. Uh, we've seen what the potential of the, the plant in Kalamazoo, Michigan was to quickly ramp up production of COVID-19 vaccines. And I think folks out there want the US to kind of be this arsenal of, 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 of vaccine uh, diplomacy. And we can do that through, through manufacturing and, and, and working closely with the companies that have brought these medicines to market so quickly to begin with. The main concern we have with the waiver is that it would potentially uh, kind of strain the supply chain and that you know you have a number of smaller companies that don't have this experience trying to get into the market of making mRNA vaccines and other vaccines uh, and, and potentially using some of those raw materials that Pfizer, Moderna, J&J &J need in order to make their vaccine. And it could actually hinder the response. So we think you can do it by working with existing manufacturers to ramp up capacity and supply that to the rest of the world. Um, you know, we don't think that the waiver is needed and we think it actually could make things worse. Well, thanks, Mike. That's very helpful. I was going to ask you an HR3 question, but you addressed that already um, in mentioning the fact that the, I think it was the Congressional Budget Office that said that fewer new medications will come to front when, when such extreme price control measures get passed. So um, with that, I wanted to turn to Wayne Kreesap. And, and Mike, thanks uh, for, for your time. I would also add, if you do have a, another couple of questions, either email us or go ahead and email 
questions for Mike in the chat and we'll get those answers to you. But first, Wayne is a district representative of the Iron Workers Sa Safety and Health Department. And in that job, he addresses construction and industry safety issues in the field in shop environments. He's one of the uh, Iron Worker Safety Training Director course instructors that has delivered presentations on contractor pre-qualification, OSHA requirements, and most importantly for our discussion, uh, COVID-19 preparedness and, and, and response. Uh, Wayne, I'll just turn it over to you. I know you've got an interesting perspective. Uh, one of the things that was, um, you know, some good news during the course of this pandemic is that uh, construction workers were deemed as essential workers and were allowed to get back to provide for their families. But the other side of that two-edged sword is there was exposure risks to them and, and, and guys like you and, and men and women in the iron workers and the rest of the crafts have been charged with making sure they're safe. So I'll let you um, let us know what your thoughts are. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yep. All right, here we go. Um, we, uh, so yeah, so Tim, thank you very much and appreciate the opportunity with Pilma to be a part of the presentation today. I know uh, Steve Rank, our executive director of safety and health was scheduled to, uh, to speak today and unfortunately he wasn't able to and so I'm kind of pinch hitting. So I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the program and I uh, really enjoyed uh, Dr. Mike's presentation on the front end. So uh, thank you for that insight as well. A uh, little bit about uh, what we have with the iron workers as far as uh, our challenges, you know, in the safety and health department, uh, when the COVID pandemic came around, there was a lot of uh, uncertainty in the industry about how things were going to be handled. And, uh, and so I wanted to at least take a little bit of time here on some of the points here just to kind of share a little bit about uh, who we are in, our, in the iron workers safety and health department, as well as addressing some of the different challenges like Tim mentioned. Uh, that it had gone on pretty much throughout North America as uh, as we struggled with, you know, the initial response and then uh, and the constant changes based on the different guidance as it was coming out from from the uh, from the CDC and OSHA. So there was definitely some some challenges there. And then I also wanted to share some things on what we did in response. Uh, as you know, I know we're just one of the trades that we're we're doing a lot of things. Uh, fortunately, in working with all the other building trades, they, uh, there was a really good response and a lot of communication among all the different tr uh, trades, uh, especially among the safety and health professionals. And it was uh, very helpful uh, to be able to kind of share some best practices, especially early on as we move through things. And uh, then I wanted to just take a minute and just share a little bit about some of the things we're working on into 2021 and 2022. So uh, before I get going too far, I wanted to at least uh, do a quick introduction of our Iron Workers Safety and Health Department. I'm really proud of the team that we have here. Obviously our director, Steve Rank, uh, myself and Christy Rose here in the United States. Christy is our admin out of the Chicago area and she does a fantastic job of keeping us straight and, uh, and organized. And then we have Jeff Norris and Sandy Lestwicka up in Canada uh, that address all of the different safety issues that go on up in the uh, uh, the provinces and Northwest Territory, Northern Territory. So they do an outstanding job and, and uh, really try to keep things on. And they, they really understand the differences of what goes on here in the States when it comes to safety and health versus the things that they have to deal with provincially uh, in Canada. So a uh, great group of people to have the opportunity to work with. Uh, as far as the challenges that we went, that, that we had to go with uh, on the, in the pandemic is like I, like I said before, is there's constantly changing guidance from the CDC and OSHA. Sometimes it was practically hourly where, you know, we were doing one thing, it was, you know, initially surface contact. And then we was, you know, maybe it's being transmitted from children to adults. Then it was maybe, you know, how much of this is aerosolized and, and an airborne transmissible disease. And what do we need to do to help protect ourselves from that? And again, we're, we're on the construction side, we're on the back end and we're, we're trying to deal with this. So we have, you know, our owner clients are out there, you know, giving us instruction on what they want. Our general contractors are telling us what they want. And then our own uh, employers with, that uh, we're working for, we're also trying to adjust all those different rules. So there might have been site requirements as well as, uh, you know, general contractor or other contractual requirements that we were trying to follow. And uh, so obviously we were, we were hitting through with, you know, physical distancing and, and a lot of the different cough, sneeze etiquette, hand washing, not sharing the tools, cleaning and disinfecting, all of those, those things. But we also ran into situations like what you see here in this, in this photo here in the bottom, bottom right center, is you kind of see this individual here 
you know, he's up on this lift and he's all by himself. And so we had, in some cases, situations where you already had our, our physical distancing kind of was already built in. And uh, we were looking for a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of leniency on some of these different policies just because it was a, a bit of a challenge. It also led to concerns, you know, when, uh, again, in our industry, I'm very proud of the construction industry with how we were able to respond, you know, again, being a lot of us being deemed essential and having to work around North America on different projects, whether it was working in the pharmaceutical industry as things were ramping up or uh, dealing with seismic uh, requirements in different parts of the country for earthquakes, uh, or even, uh, you know, helping to make sure that, uh, that the power plants were still working so the lights would stay on. Uh, were all different elements that a lot of our trades were all continuing to work uh, behind the scenes. And uh, there were really a lot of, I know we, we praise a lot with our, with, uh, our, our healthcare industry, but uh, the construction industry and industrial maintenance side also did quite a bit to help serve, serve uh, the United States uh, as well. So uh, the other challenge that we had, uh, again, as end users, is because a lot of the personal protective equipment was being uh, diverted to the healthcare industry, we still had to utilize some of it. And uh, it was a real challenge for us to be able to get our hands on actual N95 respirators. Uh, you know, Mike, Dr. Mike mentioned about counterfeit, uh, you know, possible products when you're looking at the vaccines. Well, we had, we had counterfeit respirators that were flooding the market once everything hit. And it was a real challenge for our industry to separate what was a legitimate respirator versus what was counterfeit as well as uh, just understanding the differences among all the different types of face coverings. So it all uh, played a role as we, as we moved th through things and as, the, as we evolved through the pandemic. Uh, I mentioned before the essential and non-essential workforce. Again, our, our folks really did a great job of trying to adjust. There was definitely some uh, learning curves as we went through. We had people, you know, especially putting on the face coverings for the first time and, and, and on job sites that required 100% safety glasses as well. Uh, the fogging issue that you know that we've dealt with for the past 25 years still hasn't quite gone away, and uh, so we were still dealing with that. Uh, and uh, and that also led to a situations where there were concerns about that possibly creating a greater hazard. And we were we were happy to be able to work with our different owner clients and our and our general contractors to get them to understand that we have we have some situations that when we're working up high on the steel and we're wearing our safety glasses and we're wearing a face covering and those glasses are fogging up that it does create a bit of a greater hazard for us to be able to work around uh, to, to, to reduce our risk of the other inherent that hazards that we're dealing with on the daily basis, you know, such as the fall hazards are getting hit or struck by other objects. So we uh, were looking at different ways to try to handle that the best that we could, but also uh, again, in some situations, maybe, uh, uh, have a little bit of uh, uh, leniency on, on a couple of situations, again, case by case as we work through it. Sometimes those one size fits all kind of policies uh, created a little bit of challenges for us. And then of course, we, other, we also ran into various travel restrictions as well. And uh, uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our crafts have, have, are still continuing to do, deal with that on, on that end, uh, which kind of led us to uh, having to adjust and do things uh, remotely. So uh, we, it, it uh, spurred the safety and health department within the iron workers to, to generate a new uh, 800 number uh, and a new email address for our members to be able to reach out to us. And I should probably also stop and mention as well, you know, not only with the iron workers, but the iron workers have our iron worker management progressive cooperative action trust. And that is uh, the impact program. That's our labor management cooperative program that we handle. And um, our leadership within the iron workers had the foresight uh, years ago to recognize that uh, the safety and health transcends not just for our members, but also to our contractors, our signatory employers, but also to our owner clients. And so they put the funding for the iron worker safety and health department underneath the impact umbrella. And that allows the uh, safety and health department to provide products and services, not only to our brothers and sisters, our members, but also to our signatory employers and to our owner clients who are also on this call. So uh, again, if there's something that we can do to help, uh, certainly don't hesitate to reach out and we'll be happy to do that. We also put together an Ironworker uh, COVID-19 response kit and, and a Dropbox folder that we made available to all of our, uh, our members or anyone who had an interest or, or needed to have information. Again, we collected information from all around the industry 
and put it together as forms of checklists and uh, different types of sample programs, different types of sample posters, uh, different types of training on how to understand the different aspects of respiratory protection. All of those kinds of things were, were kept in a big Dropbox folder. And we continually, we still update it even today as, as things have evolved uh, to help keep people up, up to speed. So it was a nice resource that we had available and instead of trying to email out tons and tons of stuff, you just had a single link for it. They could go and download it and find that information. We also put together a COVID reporting form, and I'll explain a little bit more about that here in a, in a couple of minutes. And then we also expanded our online opportunities. One of the things that our Iron Workers International uh, training program, our training fund has put together was a learning management system. And that learning management system has actually been around for several years, but it really got a workout the last uh, year and a half. And uh, it allowed for us to be able to continue to extend our training, uh, even while our different uh, training centers were shut down. Uh, it allowed people to get their training remotely and then schedule and work on times where they could come in and get some of the hands-on things that they needed to do uh, in, in an appropriate schedule in a safe manner. Uh, we also put together some district council lunch and learns and some international safety calls, as well as our Canadian calls to safety and then our impact uh, safety and health roundtables. And I'll explain a little bit more about what, what those are as, as we move through too. So these are the phone numbers that we utilize for the Iron Workers uh, Safety and Health Department. So it allows, allows folks to be able to reach out to us directly. We figured that was the most convenient and uh, efficient way for people to reach us. And uh, people are taking advantage of that. Uh, and then we also, obviously we did a lot of training. So we helped explain some of the hierarchy of controls, trying to help eliminate substitute uh, and use administrative controls. And then as a last resort was the personal protective equipment. And I think that was one of the things that we found very challenging throughout the pandemic is the, uh, you know, trying to, trying to follow that hierarchy of controls, but really ultimately a lot of times things came down to the personal protective equipment. And that created some, certainly some challenges for us. Our supply chain issues that we had in the industry uh, were, were, were vast. And in, in fact, we still are struggling with still getting our hands on uh, proper N95 respirators even now, you know, unless you buy, uh, you know, off of, of the main brand or main uh, manufacturer. Um, some of the, we, we also hit some of these things, but one of the things I just wanted to share here was, was uh, just in the photo on the right-hand side here are some of the things that were done, especially uh, early on in the pandemic with the temperature taking and the, and the questionnaires that were handled. Uh, that led to uh, choke points on our job sites where we were trying to get people streamed through, but uh, it did create a little bit of a challenge for us initially once we, you know, to get through that learning curve on how we could schedule and, and keep people moving through the gates and still allow them to stay physically distanced. Uh, this was the reporting form I mentioned earlier. This is uh, something that we did internally within the Iron Workers International. Uh, it's only a reporting form that we're using for internal purposes only, but we provide weekly updates throughout the international as to what we've had reported back to us. And it was basically just a very simple form that uh, people can click and uh, fill out and then send in to us to let us know if anybody had, uh, uh, had self-quarantined and tested positive or, uh, uh, or negative for COVID. And then we were trying to help keep some data on that. So uh, we put together... Uh, this is a little bit of an updated uh, uh, slide for us. We put to work through Google Maps and put together a map of the United States and Canada to kind of show where we were getting our, our hits as far as our reported cases that actually came into us. And as of this point, we had 401 reported cases, 324 in the United States, 77 in Canada. And the status of those cases at, at, here again that we have at the time was that we had 72 individuals had recovered, 312 had been self-quarantined, and unfortunately, we had 17 uh, deaths, seven active members, and 10 re retirees. Again, this is what was reported to us. We, so we may not have all that information, but we were doing a pretty good job of keeping track on it. And when I, when I give kudos to Christy Rose and our safety and health department for all the work she has done in handling this, she helps put together these lists that I'm able to help take and then put together in this Google map to help uh, put uh, push pins down for people to see where these hotspots are. But I, you know, the interesting thing with this is that as we've looked at this within the, with the iron workers and you advance to, you see what's going on in the United States with COVID uh, or even up in Canada, as far as the, the tests that had gone on, it pretty much mirrored the same spots that we had uh, 
for the rest of the population. So I don't know if it really made that much of a difference, but it did get, kind of give us an idea or a little bit of a flavor of where things were going. Obviously in different parts of the country at different times, you know, the East Coast, West Coast, Pacific Northwest had uh, uh, had some pretty, pretty high numbers. And then as things started to spread and hit the Midwest, then we also saw that kind of shift as things went on as well. Uh, as far as our, our distance learning, what we put together is in uh, through 2020 and 2021, uh, obviously like the rest of the world, we've moved to uh, online forums where we put together uh, a variety of different safety port courses. Uh, we have our, uh, our impact uh, labor management um, safety and health roundtable. We do a couple of times a year. Normally that's in person. We've had to do that one online. We have our next one scheduled for uh, for July 20th, it'll be another online forum uh, utilizing Ring Central, which is very similar to Zoom. And uh, that's been a really effective way for us to reach out to folks and uh, stay connected. And again, any of our uh, owner clients, our pharma uh, employers that are on, on the line here are welcome to join us on that uh, the safety and health roundtable call. We'd, we'd be happy to have that kind of participation. Uh, we also uh, developed uh, through the course of this uh, pandemic, we also developed what we called a lunch and learn. And this was a way for us to reach out to our district councils and, and have, have good local information. So, you know, people in Saskatchewan weren't dealing with the same issues that folks in California are dealing with or, or uh, other parts of the country. Uh, so this gave us that opportunity to be able to, to help separate all these different uh, district councils and allow them to talk about things that were specific to their area. And so, uh, we've had 11 of these in the last uh, year plus, and uh, they're, they're only an hour in duration. It's scheduled through the lunch break, and it allows our, um, our union members, our employers, our signatory employers, as well as our owner clients uh, to all jump on, uh, again, a Ring Central call and uh, kind of air out different things and talk about things that are, sp that are issues that are germane to their area. And it's been very helpful to, to have some of these things. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion on, on the coronavirus. Uh, we also spent a lot of time talking about OSHA subpart R compliance directive, some of the challenges that we face uh, with that and dealing with uh, you know, the decking issues and the shear stud issues. Obviously, fall protection for our industry continues to play a role. Um, and then uh, you know, we also spent some time dealing with the mental health aspect of this. This has certainly been a challenge for us in the industry. And we've, we've done uh, uh, the iron workers as well as a number of the other building trades have really stepped up to try to help reduce the stigma associated with mental health, letting people know where they can go to get assistance, whether it's through their own member assistance programs uh, within their local unions or through their employer assistance programs or even calling the, the uh, national uh, suicide prevention hotline. So a lot of different resources available for folks uh, as they have struggled through uh, handling the pandemic. Uh, we also have a partnership with 3M Personal Safety Division where we've been uh, working on uh, personal fall arrest training, uh, uh, powered air purifying respirators, doing medical evaluations and, and some additional training uh, and just a lot of different things uh, that have been in development here over the course of time. We're also working on with 3M a, a, an electronic catalog that will have iron worker specific uh, personal uh, protective equipment that will be available or, or that employ that employers or members can can go and purchase them but it would be it's all geared specifically toward the iron working trade uh, some other things that we talked about in the past uh, was also you know again the difference between respirators and masks I know as a safety and health person this drove me bonkers initially in the pandemic when you would have and I don't care pick a channel any of the media would have something going on and they would have a, a video clip of somebody standing there wearing a surgical mask and they would and they and they would do a voiceover and talk about wearing a respirator and it would drive me absolutely crazy because it, it didn't quite match uh, the message and uh, and it was really challenging and you know our folks in our industry are usually pretty good about understanding what a respirator is but when these face coverings and neck gaiters and, and other things start getting introduced it really led to some confusion and we had to do a little bit of extra training on that for for some of our folks to help kind of bring everybody up to speed. Uh, I mentioned some of the other fall protection issues. This is one that uh, is certainly near and dear to, uh, to the iron workers and that is the open uh, steel like this where there's a compliance directive that we're currently working to, uh, uh, to try to get uh, turned around here. Basically, we just wanna make sure we have our decking. The compliance directive states that, hey, as long as people are tied off, uh, then you don't have to worry about that. And all we're looking for is to make sure that we have the decking in place because it helps create 
uh, and prevent falling object hazards to other people who might be working down below. And so we'll, you know, and again, in the interest of time, we'll um, move on from this, but this is something that obviously is a, a big concern, not only for the iron workers, but all the other trades who may have to be working in other areas uh, around the site that could have objects dropped on. Uh, other issues uh, that, we, that we're also looking at are other initiatives. We're, uh, we're trying to get into the, uh, uh, we're dealing with fall protection training. We're also looking at a safety director training course and iron worker safety supervisor certification. A uh, little bit of a difference here when we start talking about fall protection, but just because in this photo here, you see someone is 100% tied off, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have 100% fall protection. So, uh, you, know, you know, just because they have it on doesn't mean that it's actually being used properly. And uh, if you happen to look at this a little bit closer, you'll see down here in the bottom, this retractable lifeline, that's this retractable lanyard that's set up. If this individual were to happen to fall, he would have to come down all the way down off of the steel get completely underneath this thing and, and before that thing ever locks up to catch it. Now, how much force is being generated on all this equipment and on this iron worker's body in the process before he gets underneath there? And what has he fallen into on the way down? So as a result of that, we're working on doing some different training. We have these mock-up structures all over the United States and Canada. And again, in our partnership with 3M Personal Safety, we're working on doing some personal fall arrest training to make sure that we educate our supervisors as well as our members on the different types and limitations of personal fall arrest equipment. Again, when you look at it, it's the last resort, but this is a way for us to try to help best protect people. Uh, I mentioned our safety director training course. This is something that unfortunately we've had to put on a bit of a hiatus here between uh, the COVID pandemic from last year and this year, but we're looking at, at bringing it back in 2022 and having everybody in person. Uh, so far, we've had over 500 iron workers have gone through this course, uh, successfully completed the course, and it's just been a really good way for us to uh, hopefully have some iron workers extend their careers. They know the industry, they know the trade, the profession, uh, but this course helps give them a little bit of that safety background so that they can better understand uh, the rules and regulations and how everything goes with safety. I know personally, when I look back on this, uh, this is some of the things that are taught in this class I would have liked to have known 25 years ago. It would help make my life a lot easier. And I think uh, our members are, are also uh, appreciative of that. This course, we also make it available to our signatory employers and again, our owner clients. We've had folks from Ford and General Motors that have sat through this as well. So again, invitation to our, uh, to our farm uh, folks. We'd love to have you come and join us when we make the announcement for these classes in the future. Um, one of the other initiatives is, uh, is understanding what a supervisor's role is, is just because someone comes out of the trade as an iron worker uh, and they happen to become a foreman or a supervisor working for an employer, they need to understand what that limitation is or what that means and that they actually represent the employer in that situation, even though they might be a craft worker. Uh, and there's decisions from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and National Labor Relations Board that, that uh, we're looking at utilizing to help explain that so that they understand what their roles are as a supervisor on a job site. So um, with that, this is, uh, I, I guess, just to kind of wrap everything up, we, I think the, uh, the industry has done a really good job in trying to help meet the challenges associated with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, it's led us to go in different directions and try to use different technology. And then uh, we've also are, are continuing to look ahead and explore new opportunities uh, to try to help educate our members and work with our employers and our owner clients in the future. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing here and I'll turn it back over to you, Tim. Well, just, just a quick observation, Wayne, and thank you. And, and uh, construction workers work in dangerous places. That's, that's very clear. But it's also clear that if they didn't do this kind of work and do it safely, we wouldn't have things like vaccines and therapies because of the density in the biopharmaceutical industry. We know that uh, sheet metal workers, electricians, plumbers, and operators all have a sterling safety record and they work hard to make it uh, even more improved. Uh, for those of you in the audience, I'm sure you know this, but uh, six, uh, something like 1,600 training facilities aggregated among the building trades across the US, more than $1.5 billion a year spent on apprenticeship programs. So a lot of that is on safety. Uh, we've got enough time just for one kind of general question, uh, Wayne, and that is to get your sense, how well did the construction and industrial maintenance industries respond to the COVID-19 pandemic from your viewpoint as a safety officer? Sure. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Tim. From my viewpoint, I, I think the uh, the industrial maintenance and construction industries, I think they uh, responded very well. They were very open. Obviously, they were concerned. They were trying to figure out the best way to help protect uh, their employees, our members. And in a lot of cases, we were in, uh, in, in, in unison in trying to help do that. Some cases were a little bit different. We did run into some challenges, uh, you know, especially when the different types of COVID testing first came out, you know, a lot of people wanted to just start doing testing, but the question that had to be asked was, well, what are you going to do with the results and how are you going to handle that? And what, how long are those test results going to be for? And that created some challenges for us. And, and another thing that we got into was, was wearable technology, you know, with just like proximity, you know, if devices, if somebody got too close to someone and they ended up testing positive, then they had some kind of records. And we've had, had some success at a few projects where people were actually utilizing that. I don't know if it's it you know will become a mainstream type of a thing, but uh, at least in this particular case, it was very open. You know, I know within the trades, there's a, obviously a concern about Big Brother watching and having those kind of uh, devices, the wearables on people. But uh, I think uh, in response to the pandemic, at least initially with what we were trying to do, there was maybe a little bit more receptiveness to to considering that type of technology for a very limited scope. Great. Well, Wayne, thank you very much for your time and, and for your work in, in keeping uh, brothers and sisters in, in the iron workers and in the construction industry safe. Uh, that kind of concludes us, but I wanted to let you know that we're going to continue to do these things. We'd love to hear feedback from you. If this is helpful to you, if you've got other questions, please let us know. On June 15th, we're going to have uh, our next briefing, and that is on substance abuse and addiction. Many of you know that the construction industry uh, is assailed by this because of issues regarding pain management and being on the uh, on the job site and how that translates into um, uh, some really severe uh, addiction issues. We're, we're fortunate to have industry resources from, from pharma and some uh, related organizations. And we also hope to hear from the building trades. Uh, we're gonna have a panel of experts speak about that. So. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm looking forward to the time that we can see, once again see each other and, uh, and, and share ideas and, and challenging questions into the future. So thanks so much and we hope to hear from you soon.